our distinguished chairman, Manfred. I'm chairing, I have my privilege to chair. I apologize. I've got a bout of hay fever and I've been up all the evening on other matters with the media in America. But it is a great uh, morning we have ahead of us and I'm delighted to introduce Professor Michael Romani. Maurice. Maurice Romani, okay. Uh, the professor uh, is a professor of politics and Middle East studies at Ben Gurion University and director of the El Yahab Center for Islamic Studies. He was educated in the United States and England. He was a research associate at Harvard University and later at the Center for Postgraduate Hebrew Studies at Oxford. He's an expert on Muslim Jewish relations, on minorities, and the effects of modernization on ethnic groups in the Middle East. His publications include books and articles on these topics. And today, he's going to be talking to us about a fascinating Jewish community of the past that is no longer Libyan Jewry. And the title of his address, as you know, is Closing the Circle After 2000 Years. It is my great pleasure to invite you, Maurice. What I'm going to do uh, today with you is to subject you to, for half an hour or 45 minutes, to what I have been subjected for three, four, or five years of uh, research on the history of Libya, and much longer than that in gathering material from archives from a uh, few countries and in different languages. So. You have to bear with me to take you on a tour of this very interesting, what I find interesting, not because I was born there, but nonetheless, I find it a very interesting community when I compare it to other North African uh, communities or other communities in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I shall, since we have only really limited time, I shall try to limit myself in highlighting three or four topics that I think should be very interesting to you and would be uh, interesting to know how this Jewish community ended up after 2,500 years living in Libya. So um, I would like to show you, I will, I will try to uh, deal with the origins of Libyan Jews in ancient, ancient times, but I'll give you a, a, a small tour on, on the introduction to Libyan Jewry, if I can manage this um, machine here. Uh, boom, boom. No. I want it back, just a minute. All right. Okay. Uh, the origins of Libyan Jews in modern times. You have the Ottoman period that started in 1551 and ended up with 1711. The, then the Karamanli dynasty, which is also a local dynasty that was in Libya. And then from that period, 1835 to 1911, there was a second Ottoman period which ruled Libya and obviously the Jewish community and other minorities. And then we have the Italian period, 1911-1943. And then the British military administration after the Second World War, 43 to 52. And the Libyan monarchy from 52 to 69. And Gaddafi's revolution to 69 to the present. Throughout all these periods, Jewish communities lived in Tripoli, in Benghazi, major centers, and other towns in the vicinity of Tripoli or in the provinces which are called Tripolitania and Cyrenaica, and the southern part is Fezzan. Now, what uh, I will uh, try to, to, uh, to deal with is the first uh, period of the ancient history. Now, as you know, Libya borders with Egypt, on the east and even with Tunisia on the Maghreb, on the west, and yet until recently it was excluded from Maghreb studies and therefore its treatment by the scholarly community was marginal. 
more than twice the size of Texas. Its population is sparse. Now today they have about between five and six million people. And as uh, my friend had said uh, now just before me, today there are no Jews in Libya. The early settlement of Jews in Libya is not clear. Isolated archaeological findings attest to Jewish presence in Libya as early as the Phoenician sailors who established trading posts along the coastline of Ethiopia. Others give the date of the destruction of the first temple in 586 uh, BCE. And uh, um, uh, before the first temple in 586 BCE, and uh, some say uh, that Ptolemy Lagos of uh, Egypt of the fourth century BC settled Jews in the Cyrenaica Pentapolis, the five cities, and later into Politania to strengthen his regime. Jewish objects from this period were discovered in places like Zliten and Busetta, small towns in Politania. At the beginning of the Roman rule in 146 BCE, we are told that inscriptions in Benghazi and elsewhere in Libya attest to the, present, the presence of wealthy, well-established, well-organized Jewish community. Most Jews lived in farming villages and were potters, sailors, stonemasons, weavers, and merchants. Others tell us that in 71 after CE, Titus deported 12 boat loads with captives from Judea to Cyrenaica. At the time, we are told, Jews of Cyrenaica had already a synagogue of their own in Jerusalem. Twice, the Jews of Cyrenaica revolted against Rome in 73 and 115 CE, and both times were crushed. Many of them fled from the coast to the interior, where some of their descendants known as cave dwellers. And these were discovered in 1949 before the mass Aliyah that brought these people between 1949 and 1952 in the Mass Aliyah to Israel. At that time, there were only about 36,000 Jews, but 94% of them made the Aliyah thanks to, and I'll deal with this later on. The repeated struggles uh, uh, um, uh, uh, between Jews and Romans in the first and second century hampered the cultural and the economic development of Jews everywhere in North Africa. But once peace was restored and the communities were integrated in the Pax Romana, <coughs> Judaism entered a new phase of development and re reorganization and prosperity. In the fifth in in century, Augustine noted one of the writings large size of Jewish communities in OEA, the five uh, cities, now Tripoli, and its notoriety is known in Jewish, Jewish, Jewish scholars. The Muslim period started in 642. The Arab governor of Egypt seized, seized Cyrenaica and Tripolitania from the Byzantine rulers, where he encountered the resistance of the Berber tribes. Later, the Arab historian Ibn Khaldun observed that one of those who led the resistance against the Arabs between the years 688 and 693 was a woman, woman chieftain called the Kahina of the Judaized tribe of uh, Jerawa in North Africa. But little is known of the Libyan Jewish community in the first few centuries of the Muslim rule, which were marked by continuing strife between Arabs and Berbers in North, throughout North Africa. This does not mean that some of these communities, like these of the Kadames, Lebda, and Barche in Cherenaika, did not flourish later in the 10th and 11th century. We know about the rise of the Almoha dynasty in Morocco, in North Africa, and it's true, during the 12th and 13th century, brought havoc to many Jewish communities, Indian <coughs> Jews included. From then on, and until the Spanish expulsion, our sources are silent. It may be that we have not got to those sources, or maybe that they have vanished. I tend to believe that the former is likely. <coughs> From the 16th century onwards, onwards, we are more solid on solid grounds in tracing accurately the evolution of this community. In fact, the history of this period is so rich that for the sake of time, you know, we will not go into uh, the, the, the details. Just sufficiently to say that 1510, the Spaniards held Libya for a brief period of 40 years. The country then had 800 Jewish families, 
Some of them fled to the mountain areas of Garyan and Tajura, and these are, you will see on the maps that I will show you. Others were taken prisoners and tortured under the laws of the Inquisition, yet others were taken to Naples and sold as slaves. Thus, when the Ottoman conquered Libya in 1551, Fifteen fifty one. They found the Jewish community suffering from both economic and spiritual deprivation. A rabbi by the same by the name of Shimon Nabi coming uh, from Spain and passing through to go to Palestine found the Jewish community that to the extent that on Friday night we have a special uh, Shimona Esrei in, in the synagogue, they used to read the Shimona Esrei of the uh, Hall of the uh, daily uh, Amida Shmona Esrei. So he had to introduce this aspect of a, uh, of a prayer that Ataki Dasha of, of the of the Shabbat one to be said aloud even by the Chazan when he has to say it in silence, in meditation. You know, it's, it's very interesting what he contributed and he stayed there and he did not go to Palestine and in fact he is attributed to having uh, composed the, uh, uh, the poem of Bar Yochai. With the conquest of Libya, the Ottoman, the, by the Ottomans, Jews in Libya came in direct contact with other Jews of the empire. Spiritual leaders came as far as from Morocco, Turkey, Palestine, Salonika in Greece, to lead the community in the spiritual and social matters. Some of these, those who were deported to Naples by the Spaniards, returned to Tripoli to take lead in fields of commerce, trade, and community affairs. By the way, I found some of the names of families that some have said that uh, some of the research by the by Italians in 1943, they uh, found out that uh, names like Guetta and like Arbib and so on are descendant of Berbers. There is a, a debate about these uh, names, whether they come from there or they come from elsewhere. Our family as well, uh, just yesterday, uh, two days ago, uh, uh, a film was projected about Jews of Libya that my sister did through a memoirs of my mother uh, uh, of the Romani family, but it covered the whole of the Jew <coughs> Libyan Jewish community was projected in Paris. And one of the issues that we have been dealing with for the last, I don't know, 20, 25 years is where the Romani name derives from. So the question is this, whether these Jews have really, after going through all these traumatic experiences of 2,000 years before the modern times, whether these people have come from Spain, have come from the Turkish Empire, have come from Italy, have come from Livorno, or they were autochthonous from the local mixing with the Berbers or the Berbers that were Judaized and so on. This is a research, an open questioning and the research on Libyan Jews in particular, but also on North African Jews in general. Okay. So the events disrupted, uh, we're talking about the Ottoman Empire. Um, when the uh, question of uh, the Second uh, Ottoman Empire ended in 1911, Italy came in in 1911, and under the pretext that its Italian population is not getting what it should be uh, under the commer commercial pact with the Ottoman Empire, under that pretext, Italy invaded uh, uh, Libya and got into uh, and occupied Libya between 1911 until 1943. Now, after 43, we have uh, the, uh, the Italians being defeated uh, with the Germans, and we have the British military administration ruling between 43 and 52. And then we have the Libyan monarchy, as you know, between, under Idris and Awal, the first Idris from 52 to 1969, and then the Gaddafi revolution. The question is this, under this period, what had happened to these Jewish communities? Under the Italian domination or under the Italian occupation, okay, you have, I, w I listed three periods, and I'm not going to deal with all of them because we don't have the time, but I'll go telegraphically on this. 1933 to 38, or let's, let's start, let me give you the, the, the outline of the Italian period, then I'll go specifically on each period, but briefly on, uh, on some periods and more elaborately on the others. Between 33 and 38, there were the Shabbat laws. These are very discriminatory laws against the Jewish Libyan community, which for them Shabbat was something, uh, something very sacred. Interestingly enough, some of them were flogged in the, uh, in the uh, squares 
of Benghazi and Tripoli for not opening their shops on Shabbat. Paradoxically, or a curiosity, today in Rome, where there are Libyan Jews, they open on Shabbat, and very happily so. Okay, and when I asked, you know, listen, your father or your parents or your grandparents were flogged in Libya for not opening their shops on Shabbat, you know, how come you do that? I said, listen, Maurice. Business. Who said business? <laughs> he said, you know, the Shabbat can make it kulam. I said, what do you mean? What do you mean? He said, listen. I tell you that also in Arabic. It's Shwaya al-Abdallah, Shwaya al-Allah, Shwaya al-Abdallah. A little bit of, to God, a little bit also to us. I go to the shul in the morning on Shabbat, seven o'clock million. I said, oh, you get up for the nights. He said, no, no, not nights, but from seven to nine, and then after nine I go and go to Not really, but not all of them do that, and today is less than it was in the 70s and the 80s. But be that as it may, the Shabbat laws, and then one of the effects of 1938 to 1943 were the racial laws that started in Italy, I'll deal with them. 1942 to 44 were the deportation of Libyan Jews to concentration camps in Europe, in Libya, and then we have, under the British administration, we come in in 1943, the major things that I will be dealing with also with is 1945, the first pogrom, 1948, the second pogrom, and then 1949 to 1952, the Aliyah, and then under the monarchy, you have 52 to 67 restrictions, political restrictions, economic, cultural, and then 1967, you have the forced exodus, and the people have left. The Italian period. There's a question. I dealt my first chapter of my book that is coming out, hopefully by September in English, in England. Was fascism anti-Semitic? Was Mussolini anti-Jewish? When we know that in 1935, Mussolini comes to Libya and declares himself the defender of Islam. And he gets a beautiful sword from the Libyan tribes. 1936, with the Berlin-Rome axis, he begins with the question of the racial discrimination against Jews in general. Now, Right, the, the rise of Islam was uh, the rise of fascism was in 1922. What were the impacts on the uh, Italian Jews and the Libyan Jews? Uh, in 1932, on the Libyan Jews there was this Shabbat laws. What school schools they had to open on Shabbat. It's mandatory attendance. This was unheard of in Libya. This was unheard of previously, and the Jewish community objected to that. Shops have to be opened. On also on uh, on the uh, on Shabbat, and I uh, and I will tell you why in a minute. The racial laws in Italy. This is the manifesto of the of the racist sci uh, scientists. Human races they had ten points by scientists. Please note of a manifesto that the Italians had put out and was communicated by Mussolini to Balbo, the governor of Libya, to, Im to, uh, to, uh, uh, to apply these laws to the Libyan Jewish community. Balbo was not so happy with Mussolini. And in fact, he, he contacted him with a letter back, um, which I don't have the time now to quote, but it was very interesting. Uh, because Mussolini answers back to him and said, uh, because Balbo writes to him and said, you know, but the Jewish population, you know how Jews are, they are half dead and so forth. And Mussolini answers back and said, the Jews are never dead. You know, so uh, uh, please apply wherever you can. But Balbo, because he was interested, and here is the rivalry between Mussolini and Balbo, because he was interested to take the place of Mussolini, and because he was interested to show his, on his record how good he was in his uh, uh, administration of the Libyan, uh, 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 Libyan um, uh, no, the Libyan country, the, 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 the colony, the colony. So he was slowed down on applying the uh, racial laws there, but he insisted on opening the schools 
And slowly there was, with a rabbi that was in, brought from the Italian Jewish community to be the rabbi of uh, the Jewish community in Libya, he was negotiating about uh, children going to school but not writing, only listening to the lectures, and slowly they came to a modus vivendi. But shops, that was a different problem, because it was interesting that the colony would prosper economically. And not only that, you have Italians coming from Sicily, from Naples, from Rome, to shop, um, uh, um, uh, weekend shopping. They would come from Friday to the colony. It was cheap to, to get material there. It's cheap, cheap to do shopping. And they would come until Monday. So he insisted that at least in the new city of Tripoli, not in the harbor, in the ghetto, that they would be open to receive these tourists to buy and make uh, and do shopping. The, um, this is the, uh, uh, the manifesto, and this has affected a lot the Libyan Jewish community. You see, the Jews do not belong to the Italian race. The Jews represent the only population which has never assimilated in Italy because it's composed of non-European racial elements and so on. The purely European physical and psychological character ought not to be altered in any way. Uh, union is admissible only with European races. So was anti uh, fascism anti-Semitic? I found few scholars that they say yes, few scholars that they say no. Lately, after Michaelis and after De Felice, their uh, publications and their research, I found out, or I, let's put it this way, I came to the conclusion that it depends on the period of fascism that we talk about. At the beginning, it did not have the root, and even in the middle part of the development of fascism from 1922, did not have a anti-Jewish uh, attitude towards it, the Italian Jews. Because Italian Jews were very well integrated in Italy throughout the ages. Italian Jews have never felt anti-Judaism or anti-Jewishness or anti-Semitism. Mussolini was ambivalent. Mussolini was ambivalent about uh, Judaism and about international, uh, excuse me, about Jewish, uh, Jewish people and about international uh, Jewish uh, um, uh, uh, communities. He flirted with Zionism, even with Weizmann, okay, but for fear that uh, he did that because he didn't want the British, but afterwards when he joined Germany, he uh, started uh, negating his relationship with Zionism, and he thought uh, the Arabs have more uh, 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 rights than, than the Jews in Palestine. Um, in Libya, in Libya, the, uh, the application of such, uh, um, uh, such measures forbade Zionist activities, closed clubs like Ben Yehuda, like Maccabi, like all these clubs, social clubs, that serve the uh, students, they serve the Jewish community, especially in Tripoli. And by the way, Tripoli had more than 20,000 people, 20,000 Jews, whereas in Benghazi or Serenaika, had barely 3,000. In 1940, Libya turned into one of the battlefields. So in June 1940, Italy joins the war. 1940, the arrest of all enemy citizens, namely the British, the French, the, Italian, uh, the, uh, the uh, Libyan Ju uh, uh, citizens, but Jewish. In 1941, uh, the monopoly of uh, uh, commerce uh, was taken from the Jews. In 1943, 1942, Mussolini ordered the Sfollamento. Sfollamento means clearing out of Libyan Jews from Libya. 1942, you, in May, you had further restrictions on business and limitations on real estate deals. In June 1942, Jews aged 18 to 45 mobilized for forced labor. Okay. Concentration camps. After Mussolini issued the Sfollamento in Italian, which means really clearing out, the deportation started. First with French citizens to Tunis and Algeria, 
by the way, the German government have recognized only three, four months ago, in claims conference, <coughs> have recognized these Jews that were deported to Tunisia. One of, uh, um, of my family was deported to Tunisia. And in one day in La Marsa, near La Goulette, we lost 13 members of our family by a bombardment between the Germans and the British, apparently. And uh, a Harvard scholar says to me, this was by accident because they thought it was a munition depot and they bombarded, but it, there were Jews there. And the Romani family, family, it's clan really, uh, a, 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 about 13 people were lost there, but many others that were shipped there uh, from Tripoli. British citizens were sent to Europe and uh, the major concentration camp was in Jado, in Libya itself. There, 2,600 people were interned. Only 2,000 came back because 560 or 562 died from typhus, from uh, other sicknesses and illnesses, from malnutrition, from uh, crowded uh, places, and uh, from uh, not only malnutrition, but no nutrition at all. Some of the British Jews, they were taken also to Bergen-Belsen. And there they met German Jews. Now, there was a question, were the Jews of Libya aware of what happening in the Shoah? And there were some uh, uh, materials, some documents that say that Jews of Libya were aware of German, uh, of what was happening in the Shoah in Germany. In fact, in fact, before the Shoah, few German uh, um, refugees passed through Libya and the Benghazi community supported them, the Jewish community supported them for a few months until the uh, American uh, um, joint had helped out and uh, took, them, uh, took them to Palestine. In, the, in between, or in between 42 and 44, still the British getting in and out of Libya, getting in and out twice, and Jews of Libya suffered from that because the first entrance of the British, they hailed the British saviors, okay, from the Italian concentration camp, etc., etc. In, in, in the second coming, uh, and then the Italians came after the, the British first coming, the Italian came back, and the Italian <coughs> punished these Jews. Second time when the British came, the Jews were more careful in uh, receiving the British. But in the meantime, what's happening? The British uh, Eighth Army had a volunteer uh, group of Palestinian volunteers, Jewish Brigade, was become, became known as the Jewish Brigade. This Jewish Brigade, its contribution to, um, to the Libyan Jews, their rehabilitation after the war, uh, education, the Zionist activities, the preparation for Aliyah were, were something immeasurable. Something that cannot be really estimated to what extent these, in less than a year and a half, this Jewish brigade, what had done to, this Jew, to these Jewish communities in Libya. <coughs> they found the community destroyed uh, at the bottom of hope, very helpless. They, they felt helpless. They came back to their homes. They could not believe how they left their homes or what they found. They were really on the ground. And they, but, 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 they, these people were still Zionist, were still very Jewish, and were still a community. But everybody is trying to find where were you, where have you been, where the Shoah in many ways had affected them more than any other communities in North Africa, more than Tunisia, definitely more than Morocco. So the Libyans, because they were closer to Egypt and to the Alamein, and the Germans were there, and the Italians and so on, and the British, so these people were very much affected. They found them, they started opening schools for them, they put children, they got material from Israel, from Palestine at the time, they were from the kibbutzim, from the other places uh, of the Miflagot and, and the parties, and uh, then there were no parties but from the Jewish agency, and they were able to rehabilitate the community and put it on its feet. Everything is fine. 1943, the British took over. Big hopes, big hopes now for the, the Jews. November 4, 
November 7. Out of the blue, Arabs took to the streets and they start massacring. It was an orchestrated event where orchestrated events throughout Tripolitania, that means Tripoli and its uh, uh, contours, Benghazi, little, not much, but the towns. The result of this pogrom from the 4th to the 7th of 1944 left 130 dead, 450 wounded, 20 widows, and 93 orphans. I'm not going to go through the list how many synagogues were destroyed, how many uh, scrolls were burned, and how many shops were destroyed of the Jews. I don't have the time. Who's for? For some reason, the British were not there. For some reason, the British police did not intervene. For some reason, the chief of police, Blackley, was in Egypt. He left two days before. Was it the British for? The Libyan Jews and the president of the community attributed that to the British. <coughs> Arab national, by the way, this pattern was duplicated in the Farhud in 1941 in Iraq during Shavuot. So one should establish, also in Aden, should one establish a pattern for this? I don't know. Arab nationalists, oh sure. Arab nationalists start coming, Arab exiles, Libyan exiles.